Um, I was always interested in knowledge and throughout my undergraduate even, which were long ago studies, and my, P and my master's and PhD studies, I was interested partly in knowledge, but with the master's also in existentialism phenomenology, which is how I had intended to go on, except that I couldn't find supervision where I was doing my graduate school, graduate work, and I couldn't do my graduate work anywhere else because I couldn't afford childcare to go away. So I started working in theory of knowledge, and in my doctoral thesis I wrote about epistemic responsibility, although that wasn't exactly what the thesis was called. It was something called knowledge and subjectivity. But it occurred to me quite early on that there were issues of responsibility that positivism and, and uh, other standard theories of knowledge didn't cover. And particularly I came to this, I guess in part from a, a strange combination of Heidegger and Wittgenstein, thinking about it at that time. I was not doing feminist philosophy at that time. In fact, there was no such thing. So um, it was theories of knowledge that I was working with. And um, as I came to writing the dissertation on knowledge and subjectivity, where I was no longer using Wittgenstein, uh, when I was no longer using Heidegger or any phenomenologists because there was no one there to supervise it, um, as I came to that point, I began to think about how issues of responsibility might connect with questions of knowledge. But there wasn't really a place to say that at that time. To me, that's kind of a later question because much of the climate change literature doesn't actually come to gender until quite further along in its development. Um, so I came, I came to thinking about climate change from already written, ha from already having written a book called "What Can She Know," which focuses entirely on gender, and from rhetorical spaces when most of it is about gender. Uh, and when I wrote ecological thinking, I wasn't particularly thinking about gender although somehow it began to emerge that there were ish issues in uh, climate change and, uh, well, not so much in climate change as in, as in thinking about eco ecology and thinking about uh, our place in the world as environmentally um, involved and protective or destructive parts of the, of the world. So when I wrote Ecological Thinking, I was not actually, believe it or not, thinking about going in, uh, about becoming a climate change scholar. That wasn't what I was, that's not what I was doing. I was thinking that ecologically there seemed to be a way of thinking that was transverse across, or that was horizontal rather than vertical. It was across places and people and things as opposed to linear in that kind of silo fashion that um, isolates things one from another. So I was interested particularly in profound interrelationships among knowing and thinking and being and doing, which are in some ways Heidegger's things as well, although I didn't come back to that in, for some time. And also, I guess, because the most uh, appealing thinker I started thinking about as an example of the kind of thinking I, I valued was Rachel Carson, I began to see some kinds of not direct and not simplistic connections between her methods of research and her femaleness perhaps femininity. Um, and it's only then subsequently that I began to think more seriously about how there are significant connections for women in thinking um, intelligently and responsibly about environmental climate change issues and how they affect different segments of populations differently and by the same token how they affect uh, gender and race and class and all those issues differently. Well, again, the answer is going to be kind of simple because I thought, uh, I've thought all along that uh, in theories of knowledge, place was as important as populations and peoples and subjectivities and, and that, uh, that claims to know and projects of knowing and all those sorts of things must have to be time, place, subjectivity, gender, race, class specific. Obviously, one can't do all of those at once, so it seemed to me that uh, pieces of those could nevertheless be amalgamated and drawn together in trying to think of a, a rather muddled and, and complex approach to knowledge, but it need not be so muddled, and there are ways through the muddle. You, know, I, I, you see, I've, I've not really called my work 
uh, being about climate change mm -hmm. at all. I've called it about ignorance of, of ecological matters. I've called it, um, I've been particularly interested by uh, the Oreskes and Conway book, um, Merchants of Doubt, um, and particularly with the way doubt is promulgated to, to um, make people not need to bother making any differences in their lives in the way that they, their lives are uh, damaging to or beneficial to the environment or how their, their living practices work. Um, so that I haven't actually, I've only started using the umbrella term climate change fairly recently and I don't use it with great comfort because I think it's about much more than climate change. It's about, uh, certainly it's about climate change, whether cl climate change is the principal factor that governs all the others or whether all the other factors lead to a, a recognition of climate change as a kind of overarching um, phenomenon that all of these practices contribute to or whether one can even use it generically as to talking about the whole world's climate changing or whether can, one, one cannot. So I'm, I'm uh, still searching for the right term. I'll, I'm prepared to, to talk about these things under the, the general heading climate change, but I do it with a little bit of discomfort because I'm not quite sure that's, um, that's the world I want to use. I'm interested in how a multiplicity of things affect human lives, non-human lives, the structure and um, multiplicity of places, people and things, and I guess one could call them environments, although I don't like that word very much because it's, it centers whatever it surrounds, and I'm not too keen on doing any kind of centering. But this is because a lot of this is, is really in the making, um, funded by a, a Social Sciences and Humanities Research Grant, uh, which I call Manufactured Uncertainty and uh, look at the way uncertainties and ignorances are politically manipulated and fed in order to grant either a sense of complacency or a sense of not needing to care about what's happening to the world around. And I have to say the world around us, although I don't mean just us, and the referent of us changes all the way through. So this sounds as if it's a muddle, and in some ways it is a muddle because it's at, the, it's at its beginning, although I've published a few things about it already. And the, the um, culpable ignorance piece, which is really a little amusing, so it's not a serious academic paper, although it is serious in its own way. The culpable ignorance piece is partly trying to ask myself the, the um, sort of down on the ground social epistemology question about how much can people be expected to know and how um, culpable or not should they be held, and I don't know by whom, but how culpable or not should they be held for knowing or failing to know or failing to estimate such things. So that's part of it.